Great. So 40 minutes. Aaron. All right. The topic of today's discussion. Topic is women in ADHD and Uh girls in ADHD because there are some key differences in the way it's expressed, diagnosed and experienced in society. So we were going to kind of dive into this topic and I think it's good because it's piggybacking on a previous episode with your mom coming and talking to us and we got to hear firsthand how the apple doesn't fall far from the tree so to speak as they say and there's a heritability factor with females in ADHD so just to start off there's if you don't know this already there's 50 percent of mothers who have a child with ADHD are likely to have ADHD themselves that's how heritable ADHD is and wow, say that wait just for the just for the people in the back of the auditorium say that again 50 percent of All right. mothers in particular who have adhd children have adhd themselves so heritable traits all right, so we're going to talk about some of the differences and why ADHD in women and girls presents in different ways than than in boys. May I jump in and and sort of call together all the conversations you and I have had over the last two years? Jump, Stephen. Jump. Here we go. I'm jumping. I know you love jumping. <laughs> all right, I <laughs> bounce. Um, bounce. I as a as an ADHD or myself with a unique lived in experience, I met with Aaron and began this journey of learning about ADHD on a more academic level. One of the more compelling facets of expanding my knowledge on ADHD was ADHD women. The topic of ADHD women is that you and I talked about regarding the diagnosis or lack thereof of girls with ADHD was this history of male psychologists, psychiatrists, male therapists, male neuro, uh, neurologists, leading a lot of the research, the early research on uh, ADHD, let alone all sorts of mental conditions, right? So there was, at the outset, an emphasis on male psychiatrists and psychologists and doctors doing research on young boys. The, so that's the factor number one. Let me pause you there for just a second because if we think about the barriers to entry into academia and the yeah. people that kind of, you know, that glass ceiling, right? It, it's not a surprise that in the 70s, 60s, 70s, we didn't have a lot of emphasis on females and how they're experiencing this, no. these various disorders, ADHD included, because there wasn't a lot of female professors who were allowed to do research and publish studies and be taken seriously. So, we're at this point now, though, um, within, I'd say, probably the last 10 to 15 years, that more and more research is coming out and there's more of an emphasis on the topic. What are the differences, the gender differences that come that are expressed with ADHD? Yeah. And may I may I remind or instill in some listeners this fact about the United States of America? It wasn't until the late 1960s that the first congresswoman wore pants in Congress, and it was allowed. She did so, what? <laughs> so in she the United, wore pants. So in the United States of A. Wait, is this a pants suit or this pants? is a, this is like pants? Like the first congresswoman to wear pants legally in the United States was in the sixties. So Are in those a shit country, kicking pants, <laughs> <laughs> shit kicking pants. No, ass kicking pants. In yeah. in the uh, in in the United States, in particular, we have had a very slow evolution towards not only female dominated research if that i mean christ if that's even a thing i don't think none of that exists female dominated right but but women in research women can dominate Stephen. oh hell yeah i'm just saying if whether or not this country that we live in always allows it (laughs) so uh it's been a long road to including women an entire gender statistically greater than males in scientific research, science study, et cetera. So establishing that fact first, it has been a long road just to get women involved, get involved. Uh, or actually, I'm sorry, that sounded like to get them lazy women involved. Well, they, no, no, they've no. been trying to, to get allow involved. them. They've been they've trying been to get involved trying. for hundreds of years. So it's been a long time since they haven't we been allowed. Got our shit the barriers together. of yeah. entry have been removed. Yes. We know yes. we know what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So the second point is that uh, is 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 uh, uniquely distinct 
or are unique to ADHDers. In boys and girls, boys versus girls, ADHD represents itself dramatically uh, differently, dramatically different between the sexes. And how's that? Tell Over, us. Overall, boys exhibit more what we might colloquially refer to as extroverted qualities. Now, not... Ooh, 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 has, ooh, yes. I have... Yes, I, yes, ooh, yes. Ooh, go ahead. I, yes, I, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I have yes, a good Aaron, question. Again, I, yes, Aaron, for the um, ninth time. Yes, uh, wait, please. I forgot. What, 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 are you, what are we talking about? Okay, Aaron, what are we talking about? Interrupting in class. <sighs> I believe we talked about this just a few minutes ago. That, you know, there are other people here. It's, you know, it's not just you and me. Everyone has a voice. So do you have something to say or did you just want to say something? Go ahead. Exactly. I forgot. So, so, so what Aaron is just, is just showcased is sort of a male or a young boy uh, representation of ADHD. Uh, interruptive, uh, sometimes disruptive. Uh, aggressive, disruptive, active, right? Extroverted Acting in out. the colloquial sense. Acting out. Uh, hyperactive and i'll come to like a aaron's definition overall definition between boys and girls in a moment which i love but for boys outward outward right you got my definition what's my definition? i got your definition girls experience adhd or or grow through adhd in a dramatically different way for girls there is a higher percentage of internal self-deprecation Shame with a capital S. Internalized symptoms, uh, daydreaming. Inattentiveness. Uh, uh, in a, exactly, inattentiveness. A lot less... Distractibility. Physically active distraction, right? The way that Aaron qualified... It's not this in me, your face. No, it's not in your face. It's on your face. It's in the background, which already you should start to get the vibe that there is a discrepancy in who gets diagnosed at what time. Because for a long period of time, boys are in your face, ADHD, and girls may be in the back of the classroom daydreaming, drifting staring out off, the window, not absorbing, staring out the window, etc. Missing directions, missing instruction, direction, chapters of books, etc. All the while, you're confronted with two or three boys per class, like, ah! and they're the ADHD ones. And it's not so obvious that the girl in the back might also have ADHD. So that's, that's the first thing. The way that Aaron described it to me, Carrie, to this day is the most compelling description. Boys who are ADHD seem to ask the question, why are you the informal you? Why are people treating me this way? Why are, why, why, why do I have to do it that way? Why is that the rule? Why are you treating me this way? Whereas girls, young girls, ask the question entirely different. Why am I acting this way? Why am I less capable than my, my classmate Sarah or my classmate Sam? Why am, why what's am wrong I drifting with me? off? Why can't, what's wrong with me? Boys ask the question in general. Again, these are what's sweeping statements. What's wrong with you? <laughs> what's wrong with you? Boys ask what's the wrong question, with the what's system? wrong with what's you? Wrong with what's wrong the with teacher? the system? What's Clearly with it's the not school? a me problem, right? Whereas girls What's wrong with the these other classmates? Right. What am I doing? Why don't they doing think I'm so interesting? <laughs> which, which, which for me, that was the first time from you that someone had qualified it so simply, but profoundly poignant. I forgot right? I said that. <laughs> Thanks you for did. You did. You did. Me. You did. Which is, which, which, which set me on a path of like, of, of self-discovery on the, the volume of misdiagnosis and overlooked, right? The title of this episode is overlooked you were listening Colin. Stephen. i'm so happy <laughs> i know i was listening i do i do listen sometimes i sometimes absorb information good because i don't so, remember what the hell i say and it sometimes is good and i'm glad you were listening because I, I would not I have rem remembered that so on this note there's a bit of an uphill battle for young girls and adult women with adhd receiving the proper diagnosis and the proper mm -hmm. care because of ultimately two massive factors one centuries of male dominated patriarchy. research and science and patriarchy combined with a distinct difference in presentation of adhd symptoms at an early age so a lot of young symptoms. girls differentiated symptoms thank you a lot of, i i just realized <laughs> you in the background i should have just let it go so at uh, um it's 2017 and still to this day masses of young girls are overlooked in ADHD diagnoses because they are not in the face of public school teachers. 
essentially. Right. And uh, uh, that's what we're here to talk about today is what, what that results, what, what are the results of that reality? We have turned up the heat, so to speak, in by 2017, in, as far as uh, uh, women researchers, uh, women psychologists, psychiatrists, coaches, ADHD oh, yeah. advocates, et cetera. And because of that, we're, we're experiencing a massive increase in diagnoses. Why? Because we are suddenly recognizing the prevalence of ADHD in women. Right. right. That's a that's a part of it. That's a part of it for sure. And, and that's something that's, facet, right? that's yeah. not discussed enough, nearly enough, no. is that no. we have adults, not only not only adults entering the fray of diagnosis, just adults in general as an entire category. But we have adult men and women entering right. that category, plus girls at entering that category and teenage girls, young women entering that category. So if you think about it, that's three new subsets of diagnoses and yeah. whole categories of people that are, haven't been diagnosed. So of course that that extends out the amount of people in general that are actually getting diagnosed with ADHD. So when we hear this cry of, oh my God, there's so much overdiagnosis and it increased this much percentage over this period to this period of time. People can cherry pick the facts, but the the truth is really that, yes, there may be some amount of unscrupulous kind of doc diagnosis because and overprescribing by physicians, but that's probably a very slim percentage of the overall exactly. like numbers. The actual numbers really reflect more of our attunement to recognizing symptoms, the flagging of symptoms, the education of, of both doctors and teachers and parents to the to the relevance of ADHD in women and girls and parents themselves as recognizing they have ADHD. And it's a lot of parents. I mean, parents come to me all the time saying, I didn't realize that I probably have ADHD. It's because I took my kid in, my, the teacher said, look, Johnny is like not focusing. He's falling behind. He's talking out in class. This is what's going on. And I, as his mom, went in and was reading through these symptoms and said, oh, shoot, actually, I had some of this stuff growing up. And mm -hmm. we saw that even with your own mom, right? Last episode, it's mm -hmm. like she started thinking about some of this stuff and was like, you know, there's some similarities here. And I didn't even like think about it until... It was brought up because it wasn't a thing. It wasn't something that even people talked about, that you could even here's, have it. <laughs> here's here's my first mini mind explosion. So we're starting in the we're starting this realm, and we'll come back to this realm of uh, young diagnoses, right, between boys and girls and how there's this massive discrepancy. It gets even more complicated the older you get. So the statistic that I was told my first Chad conference from Stephanie Sarkis, who is an incredible practitioner, an ADHD advocate who tours the United States talking about ADHD in young boys and girls, she uh, uh, highlighted the percentage of women diagnosed with ADHD. And I'm not going to give the exact age because I'll, I'll flub the statistic, but it's in the mid to late 20s. And that was in 2015 when Aaron and I met. From that lecture, the percentage, the greater percentage of women diagnosed with ADHD or just, just girls, women, right? That gender. Most of women diagnosed with ADHD were receiving that diagnosis later in life rather than earlier, right? It was, it was between 23 and 30, you know, or 25 and 30. Not when boys are getting diagnosed between six and, and 15, you know, these, these early ages, developmental years, a larger percentage of women are getting diagnosed after those de developmental years, which is so significant. That's such a massive advantage on the part of young boys versus young girls, right? That was one of the first sparks, if you will, for me in this mini obsession on male versus female ADHD and diagnoses, where it gets super, super complicated. Is in, the is in the later years, because by the time we're in our mid to late 20s and even early 30s, we have diversified so much across a wide spectrum of careers and vocations, both male and female, especially in 2017. And it becomes even more complicated defining and consolidating who is ADHD and who isn't, male or female. With, with regards to that episode between my mom and I, you find a, a woman whose ADHD characteristics, at least with regards to Lynn Tonti, 
often fueled or aided her day-to-day life amongst PTA, other moms, um, the business that she had early on in my development, like early on a couple of years after my birth, her ADHD actually helped in many ways and hindered in more ways at home, right? But as a mother and for her vocation, for what she was, the task she was performing day to day, ADHD may have actually helped more than it hurt for my mother. Whereas for uh, a friend of ours who works, uh, who started a company called Kaleidoscope in San Francisco, she's a PR manager, essentially. Her ADHD, which the diagnosis came at the age of 27, hindered her more than it helped in terms of completing tasks on time, uh, wrapping up projects, presentations, et cetera, for a high octane marketing firm in San Francisco. So again, To circle back, it gets even more complicated the older we get and the more diverse our lifestyles are, whereas in the West, at least, in the United States, when boys and girls are all taking essentially the same courses at the same rate, you know, 30,000 feet above, broad strokes here, young boys and girls are performing at much similar levels than post-college, right, or post-high school. So there's a double whammy. You know what I mean, Aaron? There's like a double, there's a double whammy. Not only is there a lack of diagnosis on the early stages, diagnosis at a later stage is far more complex and nuanced because there's such a diversity in lifestyle by the time you're in you're 27 or 25 or 30, right? So it's just it's just a, it's just a, it's it's a steady uphill battle for well over a decade, and that's it's a fucking big deal. <laughs> there's a severe error well, here there's an error well it, it makes sense when you look at it like this like when you think about women and girls tend to mature faster so developmentally they mature quicker than boys therefore sometimes they're and, and they also inter- tend to internalize so one of the gender differences and this is not to really only look at gender in terms of a binary, but just for the sake of simplicity, we all, we know there's also trans women and, and trans men here as well, which is a whole nother topic, which we should talk right. about. Aaron and I, Aaron and I, as a disclaimer, are speaking to very textbook, black and white, yeah. heteronormative differences between the male and female sexes. We're generalizing in terms of cisgender for the sake of simplicity right now and the sake of argument rather than um, And there will be a podcast episode later down the line and hopefully we, it is our hope that, you know, months from now, years from now, we're able to actually get as specific as, there's not as much genome, human genome. (laughs) There's not as much information (laughs) or other stuff about uh, gender variance and yeah. and identity, um, of or even by the way, ethnic ethnic variance, nas- nationality right. variance. Right. Like right now, it's very male female. That's it. So, but to get back to just just the gender differences between women and men, what I was saying is that is that there is this there is this pronounced difference in terms of the expression of certain types of symptoms, and in in females they tend to not express certain types of symptoms maybe because they actually are developmentally more mature. And at a certain age, it doesn't make Ooh, sense to act out or to blurt things out because those girls are kind of a little bit farther along in their development. Now, when you look at the research, you actually see mm-hmm. that when when women and young women get diagnosed tends to be in their 20s if not later mm-hmm. and it's yeah. and it's particularly when those the familial supports that they are used to within their structures of their families at home when those are removed they enter into college that's when uh, the the tasks start to become more right. individually centered and that's when they have right. to take on these this juggling act and the maturity kind of catches up because boys, you know, young men and young women in their twenties, late teens, early twenties, mid twenties, it starts to kind of even out maturity wise at that point. And the tasks that you're expected to learn and do and, and understand and and navigate through as an, as an adult, as someone that's, that's 18 and over, those things are, are not gender specific. Well, some things maybe are, but But in general, you have to manage your time. You have to take responsibility for certain things. You're, you know, you're 
your lifestyle stuff, laundry, food, other things like that, you're taking that on yourself, paying right. the bills, showing up to class, like all those things are individually tasks that you have to manage and navigate. And that's when the majority of, of women are being diagnosed. It's not when they're young, because usually they're the ones, like you said at the beginning, who can sit there and not be disruptive and fly under the radar. They're staring out the window or they're missing a direction here or there, but still they're not a problem. They're not showing themselves as being disruptive or someone that is flagging the teacher's attention. Like, ooh, there that kid over there that's really blurred out every time I ask a question or that kid that's like talking to his friends over and over and over is throwing me off in my teaching. That's different. That right there gets flagged. And that's why a lot of times boys get, get you know, get picked out from the crowd rather than girls. It's almost as if boys, purely by nature, at an early age, have no filter, and therefore try a lot of physical, verbal, intellectual activities to sort of suss out what works and what doesn't work on an animalistic level, right? On a, on a basic instinctual level, young boys, they interrupt, they, they just they just go with their gut. They go with their gut, they go with their right. gut. You know, well, I, got, well, think I have about, something to say. That's impulsivity. To impulsivity, to a T. They go with their impulse, right? So right. to finish the thought, young boys go with their impulse because they aren't emotionally developed to the level that young girls exactly. are. Exactly. They may not be age. developmentally as mature. Yeah. Whereas young girls may have already picked up, they already may have smelled the scent that certain attitudes, certain behaviors are not okay. And girls are much more socially aware and emotionally yeah. in tune it's, it's, than males in general. In general, because that's another gender difference if we're being binary here, but it's a gender difference no, that within a, bi when, yeah. within a binary, you know, framework, Context. it is, it is a difference that females tend to be more, more emotionally attuned than, than young boys, because one, that, that could be, that could be cultural or social. It could be something that we're, we're gaining through the social upbringing. We don't know, right? It's a chicken or the egg kind of thing, but but it's something sure. that I see a lot and that most people would agree with that recognizing and, and, and this is even communication style with yeah. the difference between women and men in terms of communication style. A lot of times women communicate more emotionally and intuitively and men cr communicate more factually, right. logically and and kind of, you know, want to solve things, want to do things kind of stuff versus emotional. They want to get to the get to the the solution. They want to get it done. They want to get it move on kind of thing versus right. versus caring about how, what they're saying and how it's impacting the other person on an emotional level. We've established factor A of the overall point, which is boys present more obvious tangible symptoms of ADHD because there seems to be a lack of filter naturally. Cut to the chase. Uh, try and solve things quicker than taking time and, and polling the audience, et cetera. There's, there's a, a, an instinctual drive, like efficiency, 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 which we know doesn't always mean produ productive, right? It's just like, get, you know, get it done, get it done as fast as we can. Because young girls take more time and, and a healthy amount of more time, they mature quicker and therefore they have a broader social network. They have a broader pool of information to draw from. We don't get quite as many as overt behavioral differences between ADHD girls and non-ADHD girls. Ironically, the table turns, the, the cards flip once college becomes a factor, right? Or any higher level of learning where boys have finally matured into, quote, checking themselves, into understanding they become between 18 and 27. They've right? either they're checking themselves or they've been checked enough by or society. They've been checked. No, <laughs> honestly, they've been checked by society. That's exactly my point. They've been put in detention. Yeah, so they've been told not boys, to do it over because and over Because they and over. are more prone. Yes, because more boys are more prone to act out earlier and a lot, they get checked a lot by society. So they're receiving inputs that tweak their behavior, hopefully for the better, over time, immediately, whereas girls, because they are blessed with a more aware sensibility emotionally and intellectually, yeah. they don't get but there checked is, as there much is also, by society. There is also a hormonal difference with estrogen and sure. testosterone. Sure, and sure. I'm trying to separate that for a second. Let me finish the mm -hmm. full thought. 
because girls don't receive a constant barrage of checking because boys are just more aggressive in that in that way in in early at early stages young girls in an, an un, totally unfair uh, result receive less commentary or less uh, um, te- you know teacher to student mentor to mentee reprimand behavioral because correction because they're not acting out yeah. behavioral correction because because they're actually behaving themselves it's 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 truly a, a, a kind of deep and perverse irony because they're behaving their themselves arguably more healthy than their boy counterparts at a younger age. They're receiving less information as to correct behavior overall at an early stage. And therefore, by the time they reach college versus boys reaching college, we've boys have essentially received a handicap in how to, to behave correctly or to cope, right? To, to develop coping mechanisms for these barriers and girls suddenly hit college women become young women and lose family scaffolding and friend scaffolding well, both, have to start both from scratch. Do. Both lose it. And and but and you see results what across I was, the board across right. the spectrum. But what I was gonna wise. say in terms of hormone yeah. hormonal changes for women, for young women, estrogen cycle and the hormonal changes that happen in in those years, like it's actually changing more and their ADHD comes out in a different way based on estrogen levels in their body mm. in their early 20s versus boys when actually ADHD kind of goes down. It it, it decreases. The, the problematic nature of the symptoms decrease oh. with, with the okay. hormonal changes in adolescence and puberty. So before the, right. before the boy has gone through puberty, they may be bouncing off the walls. They may be acting out hyperactively. Zero filter. They may have zero no filter. They may be no impulsive. Boundaries. And this yeah. is how I was as a child. I was, I I remember explicitly, I went to a family, uh, I think it was a Christmas holiday and I saw my cousins and I'd see them every few years, you know, two or three years at some kind of Christmas function or something. Sure. Because my mom is, my mom's side is Christian, dad's side is Jewish. That's a whole other thing. But I'd go to Christmas at my grandparents' house and I remember seeing my cousins and they were, I remember one of my cousins, who's a female, looked at me, she's a a year or two older and she goes um i'm surprised like you don't seem like the same aaron we saw this you know a few years ago like what happened <laughs> and i'm like what do you mean and like i didn't i didn't realize it i was like what are you talking about and she's just like um you were crazy <laughs> before you were yeah, like this this goes back to our earnest discussion in which I have some trouble believing everything you've told me about your high school and college experience based on how you look now. No, I know. And a lot of people, they'd meet me now and they're like, you don't have ADHD so I, or what, I, what are you I'm, talking about? I'm hearing, I'm hearing your cousin. I'm hearing what she's saying. <laughs> but if trust I knew me. If you pre now, I might be confused. But trust me, I was, was, I acted out a lot. I was disruptive, I talked out, I was impulsive, I did things just to get attention. I caused so much trouble, like all over the place. I was stereotypical, hyperactive, impulsive, combined type ADHD yeah, yeah, to the T. Yeah. And my cousin realized it and she was, but she didn't like know about ADHD or any of that stuff. She was just like commenting about how different I was. And I had realized, like now looking back, that I had gone through puberty during those years that I was probably like, I was probably like 11 or something before. And then I was like 13 or 14 when I came back the, you know, those few years later Mm. and the amount of development and maturity that I went through during that time was, was striking to this, to the point where I was like a different kid. She, she experienced me, my family experienced me in a totally different way because of that, that growth and change I had during, right. During that, that puberty time. And I think that that's actually something that happens with a lot of children. And then, and that's a difference between girls and boys is that the point in which they're going through, through puberty and how their hormones are affecting the presentation of ADHD symptoms. That's not talked about as much. Essentially we as human beings, and I'll, I'll elevate it a little bit more as we as human beings in the West, first world country, have for decades and centuries tried to compartmentalize mental conditions, physical conditions, and in doing so, broad strokes, 
we have avoided the glaring truth that there are hormonal, there are genetic variances in men and women, just sexually speaking, genetically speaking, that if not attended to, right, or accounted for, these broad strokes diagnoses and con- uh, condition definitions, right, this DSM, is lacking in a significant way because we're not accounting for a completely different body, right? A, 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 a body that is genetically, hormonally, physically different than our own because of the patriarchy for so long, right? A ruling patriarchy. Mm-hmm. We, are, we, are, we have effectively over a large swath of time eliminated another species, right? But I'm being, I'm being hyperbolic on purpose. I'm being poetic on purpose, right? Mm-hmm. We, have, we have had blinders on, horse blinders on for centuries and millennia as far as the race of the human race is concerned with regard to condition, mental, physical, emotional, et cetera. Um, in, in, in my observation and in my uh, unique lived in experience, women with ADHD have presented themselves dramatically different to other men that I've met with ADHD. And I'd like to talk about that a little more. So yeah, as far as you're aware, Aaron, mm. unpack some of those differences that are tangible, those tangible differences. Yes. So some of the differences in the way ADHD is presented between girls and boys is that girls tend to tend to fall into the inattentive category more than the hyperactive category. Now, that's a generalization. That doesn't mean that there are no hyperactive girls. I've met quite a few. But in general, women and girls tend to be more the inattentive type. And in general, they're also about 10 times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than boys. So that's the current oh. statistic right now. Um, now, the other way that it presents differently is that girls tend to be more internal in their presentation of symptoms rather than external. We've highlighted that, but I just want to be crystal clear that that's like yeah. boys are more external and their presentations are extroverts they they go out they act out and girls they act in they they blame themselves they look towards they see they see their adhd as a character fault or a character flaw versus boys who think i did something wrong or my behavior was bad or i or i'm bad like versus right that's like i'm bad versus my behavior is bad which is such a philosophically important point to make that we can't stress enough that at an early age developmentally speaking boys and girls are internalizing adhd and And many other mental conditions expressing it diametrically opposed almost like you're talking about two very different approaches and there and there are don't get me wrong there are inattentive boys that do this as well but but the re the thing is, and in those and those boys don't get diagnosed as easily either, because if right. they're inattentive type, it tends to get fly under the radar as well. So they're not fulfilling the stereotype exactly, and we've had for yeah. years a stereotype of a hyperactive child and a disruptive right. child, and that's the quintessential definition of ADHD. But when if we broaden the 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 scope of that definition and we encompass really all different three subtypes of ADHD into that, which includes the the inattentive subtype. So Aaron just pointed out something crucial, which is undeniably there is a gap, a wide gap in not only discerning, identifying, diagnosing boys and girls with ADHD, but also treating. So I'd like to ask Aaron a follow-up. Is there a dramatic difference in treating ADHD in boys and girls? Men and women? I don't think there's a huge difference in the way that you approach it and the way that you would treat it as either a parent or a clinician, I think that, or as a coach. I think that if we understand the presentation of ADHD more along the lines of executive functioning deficits, then the external presentation of symptoms in terms of hyperactivity, impulsivity, acting now, whatever it is, disruptiveness... Those things aren't the issue. Those aren't the core issues. Right. And to really right. change is, behavior. They dissolve. They go away. Right. To really change behavior, 
to address the issue, you got to get down to the root and the core. Mm. And the core mm. of it is what's going on under the surface, inside the brain, inside the psyche of the child, inside what their needs and wants and desires are. And if you can understand that intuitively and know how to communicate and connect to that child, that I think is actually more universal. Now, I say that because I think that that in terms of responding to praise or responding to criticism, ADHD boys and girls respond similarly. Like it's not different. Oh, okay. So that's something... And, and the tools that you may use aren't necessarily different. So you have, if you have a hyperactive boy, they may be acting out, whereas a girl may be acting in, blaming themselves right. and shutting down. But that doesn't mean if they're getting criticized, both are getting criticized. The boy may be throwing something or acting out or screaming or being disruptive. And the girl may be like crying and running away and hiding and giving up or something. But that doesn't mean that you address it differently. So the actual intervention in the approach could be similar which is which is trying to for instance like reduce the amount of critical feedback mm -hmm. that you're giving as a knee-jerk reaction and sure. increase the amount of of praise that you're giving towards the effort that the child is giving towards a given task understanding the difficulty of what they're trying to do given their executive functioning difficulties and and kind of highlighting for them how they're how they tried how they're doing something differently and and doing it in a way that that is supportive and positive to encourage that kind of behavior in the future i am so happy that you said exactly what you just said i don't think it gets said enough that the control is the impetus to act out or act regardless of out or in right the impetus to act right ADHDers, male or female or otherwise, boys and girls, we're feeling the same feelings, but we translate them and we present them in, in, in dramatically different ways across ethnicity, gender, and culture, right? Yeah. So we're trying to establish that, women, all of you out there, if you are looking at this world of ADHD, which is still largely male dominated, though it shouldn't be, right? It's, 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 the tide is turning, but it still is that way. If you're looking at this world and you're saying to yourself, I, I relate, I can relate, I feel this way, I, I feel distracted, I, I have thousands of thoughts every minute and I can't prioritize which one is right, I think something's 15 minutes away when it's really 30 minutes away, I have time dilation issues, you name it, et cetera, et cetera. You are part of, you may be, you may, you may be part of this community. Do not extricate yourself from the possibility of, a, of ADHD, anxiety, bipolar, autism, et cetera, do not extricate yourself from this world simply because it's largely male, right? What Aaron and I are trying to do is to explain that the symptoms look very different, but the challenges are universal. I want to drop a ton of bricks on you and ask a weighted final question you as a as a certified coach somebody who has a wealth of experience what would you recommend for any young adult or adult woman who suspects they might have adhd or be adhd as we like to say here on our podcast what would you recommend i'd say take a look at some resources that are out there for women and girls with adhd in particular um there are there's Ellen Littman, uh, mm -hmm. the author of Understanding Girls with ADHD, done a lot of great research. Um, Pat Quinn, who's the co-founder of the National Center for Girls and Women with ADHD. Uh, I would say look at various sources that, that study specifically girls and women with ADHD and get some information. Find, find out how ADHD is presented differently. Take a rating scale. Go to, you know, look at the Vanderbilt rating scale, mm -hmm. um, but also take that with a grain of salt because it's it's not it's not perfect. It's just a way to look at whether or not you may have ADHD. And there's a variety of scales out there just that you can fill out uh, some common. There's even an Attitude magazine. There was an article recently about ADHD in women. They're, they're a great resource. So you can look at some common presentations of ADHD in women, I'd say that's a great place, great resource to start with. 
and I'd see if, see if it relates to you, and then go to a professional, go to a psychiatrist or a therapist and, or licensed practitioner, and um, explore whether or not ADHD could be the reason for your difficulties. One final uh, suggestion is Linda Rogli, R O G G L I. She hosts the ADHD uh, Palooza, ADHD Women Palooza, every year. I think they might be in their third year. They're very, they're very fresh, but that is a a full week of online video lectures and tutorials and classes, essentially a a group of super badass women for a week talking about women with ADHD. It's uh, Linda, L-I-N-D-A-R-O-G-G-L-I, Rogli, talking about women with ADHD. They do it every year. And the best part is, even after they do the live speeches and lectures, you can pay for all the video content over that week. Awesome. All right. That's it. That's it for now, man. On to the next one. And this will come back, right? We'll be talking about this a lot more. Of course. Of course. Yeah. As yeah, and, and um, We ain't done we sign- until we're done. All right? We ain't done until we're done. We ain't done until everybody got a diagnosis and some treatment and some monitoring and some help. Mm-hmm. That's what we're saying. Mm-hmm. We're taking that 10% to 100% of people diagnosed. 110%. Well, will not diagnose. 110% not diagnosed. treatment. Not diagnosed. But treat it. Treat it, yes. Treatment. Treat it. Treatment. Don't get it twisted um, here. <laughs> I'm working. I'm working on that.